Welcome to the possibilities of offshore wind power for Finland and the Baltic region webinar. I'm excited to be here today to introduce you to the pot potential of offshore wind power and how it can contribute to a sustainable future. This webinar is part of Sveco Finland's Green Transition webinar series. There will be a total of 10 webinars held during the fall and next spring, each with a significant, um, sorry, <laughs> Um, uh, each with a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, the majority of our webinars will be held in Finnish language. This webinar is held in English. My name is Johanna Schild and I will be the moderator uh, at the webinar today. Uh, here is today's program. We do have three amazing experts uh, to share their knowledge and insights. To start off, uh, here are a few practical things to keep in mind. The webinar will last for one hour and we will have a Q&A session for 20 minutes after the presentations. Uh, questions can be made in the chat at 10 a.m. So after the uh, presentations, and these will be discussed if there's time remaining. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and you will receive a recording via email within a few business days after the event. Recordings will also be available on the webinar series website. The demand of renewable energy is increasing globally and offshore wind power is an excellent solution for meeting this demand. Finland has significant potential for offshore wind power and several projects with a total, total capacity of several tens of gigawatts are already in the planning stage. Today's webinar will provide an overview of offshore wind power in Finland and the Baltic Sea, uh, the strategic perspective on offshore wind power projects in the North Sea and the special conditions of the offshore wind power in Baltic Sea. We are pleased to have three esteemed speakers with us today. Anni Mikkonen, the CEO of the Finnish Wind Power Association, will provide an overview of offshore wind power in Finland. Sigurd von Lauritsen from Sveco Denmark will share his strategic perspective on offshore wind power projects in the North Sea and their importance towards net zero goals. Pekka Pokela from Gaia Consulting will discuss the special, special conditions of offshore wind power in the Baltic Sea and the required expertise from Finnish industries. We hope that today's webinar will provide valuable insights into offshore wind power and its potential. Sveco and its subsidiary Gaia Consulting wants to be with you on this journey. To, together, we can succeed in enabling the green transition. Thank you for joining us today. Anni Mikkonen has been the CEO of the Finnish Wind Power Association uh, since 2009. To, during her time at the association and the importance of wind power in the Finnish energy sector have increased significantly. Anne is one of the leading wind power experts in Finland. She holds master's, master's degrees in environmental sciences and in corporate environmental management. Anni, the stage is yours. Thank you, Johanna, and thank you for inviting me to, to this event. Let's see how my slides will work out. It's a bit slow, but eventually something is happening really slowly. Sorry about that, but does it, Johanna, look now good? It's good. You can okay. go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. 
Okay, just briefly a few words about our association. Um, it's a really, really old association, even though there's, there hasn't been wind power for that, that long time in Finland. Um, currently, we have nearly 240 companies as members, both onshore and offshore. Um, we, we cover them both. And um, yeah, we are mainly located in Jyväskylä, but nowadays we have also an office in, in Helsinki. There's three members of staff working in Helsinki. Offshore issues are actually on the table of Vera, um, who is um, on the third, on the middle row, uh, left hand side, the blonde, blonde woman there. OK, so what is happening with wind power in, in Finland? Uh, there is a fast growing capacity of, of wind power. Um, end of last year, we had 5.7 gigawatts of installed capacity, and end of this June, it had already increased to 6.1 gigawatts. Uh, we also know that there should be some 1.1 gigawatts of capacity to come online by the end of this year. So this year is going to be the second best construction year of wind power in Finland. But then when we look at the, um, yeah, just, just to also say that there's going to be also some around one gigawatt coming online next year and another gigawatt in 2025. The investment decisions of those projects have been already made. But if we look at the offshore capacity, there's not that many of that so far. Um, there was a for, for a long, long time, we had a mismatch in our figures compared to the Wind Europe figures because we had included in our figure only um, only those turbines that had subsea foundations. But in Finland, there are also nine turbines on artificial islands that that have subsea cable and Wind Europe calculated those as, as offshore turbines. So we also decided that we'll update our figures to, to be in line with, with wind, wind Europe's figures. So if we look at the capacity that is on artificial islands and on that have subsea foundations, then Finland has got 73 megawatts of offshore capacity so far. Um, I know that my Danish colleagues are always laughing at me because actually uh, all of those are really near shore. Um, I think that Poritahkoluoto uh, that has got the subsea foundations, the shortest distance to the shore is one kilometer, so it's not that far away, but it's offshore anyway. But then when we look at uh, what, what the project pipeline looks like, then you can see the strength of offshore. Um, with onshore projects, there's something like over 380 projects, 63 gigawatts in, in development. And with offshore, it's really difficult to keep the track because there's um, new study permits Coming, coming from the uh, government nearly every month. But in, in um, May, the figure was that we had something like 30 projects, uh, offshore projects under development, uh, and the capacity was around 58 gigawatts, which is also difficult to calculate because not all of the project developers are announcing how big the project is like they can say the square kilometers, but not the megawatts. Um, in, in Finland, a governmentally owned company called Metsähallitus is in, in charge of the territorial waters. There are a few projects that, are, that have been there for a long, long time and they have old contracts with Metsähallitus, but for the new new projects that um, that um, are now being developed 
they are developed through the Metsähallitus auction. So Metsähallitus is in charge of the territorial waters that, that is some 22 kilometers, up to 22 kilometers from the shore. And then on EEZ, uh, the situation is at the moment a little bit unclear how the exclusivity is granted, but at least the study permits are, are there available. And that is the figure that is growing all the time. Um, Metsähallitus has so far auctioned one, uh, one project. It's this Korsnes project that is in the middle there. And now they have announced that they've gonna auction, start auctioning two more areas, this Eppa and Edith, um, so that the auction should open any day now if it's not open yet. And then there's gonna be two more areas coming or, or announced next year. So things are also proceeding on, on the territorial waters. And why is there so much also offshore capacity under development in Finland? The thing is that there's a huge, huge need for clean electricity in, in Finland. Um, here you see that the base year is 20 22. So the electricity consumption that we had on that year is zero now in this graph. And, and the, also the wind power production that we had is sort of a base year in 2022 being zero. And here you see the increase what FinGrid, our national TSO, estimates that how the uh, industrial electricity consumption will grow and how wind power capacity is growing. And, you know, um, they are expecting a huge amount, huge increase in, in wind power production. So what is our government doing? Um, you might know that we have a new government since last May or June, June, I think. And they had several statements uh, concerning offshore wind power in, in the governmental program. Um, I collected first in the, the first slides those action points that we already know what is happening of. Um, first thing that is, uh, to my understanding, also a top top priority in the Ministry of the Economic and the Employment is to clarify the legislation concerning the EEZ. Uh, to, you know, to specify how the exclusivity will be granted, on what phase and on, on what, and under what rules what should be done, what is required from, from the company that is applying for the exclusivity. And at the moment, the legislative work is already starting and um, the governmental proposal is expected to be handed into the parliament in autumn 2024, so quite fast. Um, we don't know yet if if they're going to define some kind of an auction system also on EEZ or how it will be done. What is quite clear is that there's no governmental subsidy involved. What we are discussing now is um, auctioning of the seabed lease probably. But then, having said that there's no... Um, governmental subsidy involved. There's also a working group that has started the work last week. And uh, this working group should define how Finland would gain the competitive advantage over other Baltic Sea states, Baltic Sea projects of, of other, other countries. Um, the first stakeholder event is already tomorrow where they're going to find out um, the opinions of, of different stakeholders. And the, this working group is working until summer 2024. Um, 
the actual members are from the ministries, but then they are sort of a permanent advisors, permanent experts. And for example, our association is, is one of those. So we are very much involved with both of these, these um, things that are happening. Then there are other important statements in the governmental program. Um, first one is to clarify the tax treatment of offshore wind farms. Um, currently, because our, our property tax is calculated on the basis of the investment and construction cost of foundation, tower, and the outer cell of nacelle, uh, it means that when the rules are same, uh, you'll pay at least threefold property tax on your offshore tur turbine compared to onshore. And this is something that should be clarified or actually lowered to be specific, lowered as soon as possible. We are working, working strongly on this, that this should be done um, ASAP. Um, we've got some good signals, but um, I don't think that the work has really started yet. The other thing is then the taxation on EEZ, because currently there's no CBET lease and no property tax involved in EEZ pro projects. And in the governmental program, it is now stated that also some costs will be involved there. And, and we are also saying that, of course, the developers should have the visibility to all of the costs um, that are involved in, in EEZ as soon as possible. But these two um, taxation laws should be kept separately because the territorial water taxation is quite clear, simple, and then there's more to think with the EEZ. Government has also said that they've going to set ambitious targets for offshore wind capacity in 2035. Um, we are, of course, expecting um, ambitious targets because that will give the companies some visibility that Finland is really relying on offshore. We are as said earlier, we are not expecting this to mean governmental subsidy, but but at least the companies to know that, yes, uh, offshore wind power will be taken seriously. Um, yeah, then they are saying that somehow we'll need predictable and, and su supportive operating environment. This will be discussed also in the work, working group mentioned a couple of slides back. And then one, one statement in the governmental program is about the coexistence with, with other uh, uses of the sea, like fishing, shipping, and, and so on. Um, this is going to be interesting how this will be done. But we don't have a, a knowledge of, of that yet. And then the uh, last one that is specifically concerning offshore wind power is that um, the Ministry of the Employment and the Economy will be have a bigger role in the energy usage of, of, of the Baltic Sea than it has today. Um, Metsähallitus is supervised by the Ministry of, of Forestry and Agriculture. So somehow um, Ministry of Employment and the Economic will be having a bigger role. And then, of course, um, also an interesting, interesting statement in the governmental program for offshore is the coexistence of, of military and, and wind power. This, um, when, when the politicians are talking about this, they are mainly thinking about the eastern part of Finland, naturally, we understand that. But they are also in the western part of Finland, there are areas where the military is giving negative statements. And they have also stated quite clearly that they don't want to have any offshore wind power projects uh, below, uh, so south or east 
from the Åland Ahvenanmaa, that is the, the big Åland right south, south of Finland between Finland and Sweden. So um, if there would if if um, if uh, some technical solutions could be found for better coexistence that might open also the southern part of, of the Finnish sea areas to offshore wind power projects. Um, to our knowledge, the civil servants are working on this issue now during the autumn, and then high-level working group will start the work in the beginning of 2024. And what about the crystal ball then? How do I see what the future of, of offshore wind power looks like in Finland? Um, um, my estimate, my, my guess is that the first uh, or the next offshore wind, wind farm in the Finnish territorial waters will be constructed uh, during this decade. Probably also the construction of the second one will be started. And also I expect that some of the EEZ projects will start the construction by the end of this decade. And yeah, the government said that they're going to make ambitious targets. Um, they are probably announced in the re revision of the climate and energy strategy, or maybe it's this time called energy and climate strategy. But in the 10E, Finland has already published that uh, we could have one gigawatt of offshore capacity by 2030, five by 2040, and 12 by 2050. This is, of course, a good start, but, but not clearly not enough. Um, if we look at the uh, vision wind seas of our national TSO fin grid, um, they estimate that um, offshore wind power production could be 71 terawatt hours by 2035. And we estimate that by 2040, it could be 100 terawatt hours, meaning 25 gigawatts. So it's a lot higher than what has been published in, in 10E. But of course, we do understand why uh, the civil servants have been a bit cautious when, when uh, handing in the figures in 10E, because then they didn't have the guidelines from, from, the, mini, from the government. Now, when it's done in the energy and climate strategy, then it's done by, by the government. And of course, the um, uh, hydrogen cluster is saying that they are expecting hydrogen to need electricity some 100 terawatt hours by 2035. So there is really a need for this electricity. Yeah, that was all that I wanted to tell you this morning about the current status of offshore wind power. I um, want to um, point out that we have some wind power courses in our association, unfortunately in Finnish. Um, if, if somebody needs some courses in English, please contact Aino Herranen, my colleague. And then wanted to also point out that our offshore event is coming up on 14th of May in, in Helsinki. So that was all on my behalf. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, for the valuable insights you gave us today on the offshore wind power possibilities for Finland. Now we continue with the program um, and introduce you to Sigurd Bunk Lauritsen. He has approximately 40 years of experience in climate change, energy and environmental planning, policy development and economics. Sigurd has deep insight in the offshore sector and has been involved in offshore wind power, wind development in the North Sea, as well as in the Baltic Sea on projects in Denmark, Germany, UK, Belgium, Sweden and Finland. Lately, Sigurd has been deeply involved in planning in the planning and development of the energy island in the North Sea, 
are responsible for energy technologies and sustainability. He continues now with the topic, a strategic perspective on offshore wind power projects in the North Sea and their importance. The stage is yours. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, I'll spend the next uh, approximately 15 minutes in uh, going through what has happened and what are going to happen in the, in the North Sea over the coming uh, two decades uh, and how the North Sea has been seen by the European Union in, in total as an uh, extremely interesting place to develop, uh, to develop uh, offshore to very high level of, of capacity. And let's jump into um, what has what's behind the, the the development in the North Sea and what could in in the future maybe also be be uh, more realistic also for the Baltic Sea. Uh, the EU strategy and framework for offshore wind is put together of a lot of uh, bits and pieces uh, decided in in the European Union over the last uh, three to four years time. We have a European Green Deal uh, saying that uh, the European Union should be carbon neutral by 2050, and that requires, as we all can know and can can guess, a uh, quite significant amount of uh, renewable energy to be established uh, over the next uh, 25 years. Um, then we have an EU strategy for energy system integration. How can we integrate the energy systems in in the uh, between the sectors in the energy, energy sector, but also between the countries. So we have more cross-border uh, cooperation and, and the exchange of energy. Then we have an EU hydrogen strategy, who, which uh, pay, uh, make the, uh, pave the road for how to, to develop the uh, power to X, uh, E-methanol and E-ammonia uh, solutions in the future. And all these three of, uh, to, has have been agreed to in the last uh, three years' time. And then we can put together a number of directives uh, laying behind uh, and being updated uh, over the last uh, few years' time, and some of them are still in an updating uh, process. We have the Hydrogen Directive, Renewable Energy Directive, we have Electricity and Gas Markets, uh, we have Trans-European Transport Energy Networks Regulation, that's so, so that's a lot of bits and pieces that are paving the road for much more uh, green energy. If we just take a look on the on the, the the graph here to the left, you can see the blue dots. That's the offshore wind that has been built out in in the countries around the North Sea by 2020 in 2022, beginning 2023. So you see a relatively small amount, uh, if we take it in that way, small amount of, of uh, offshore wind capacity. But but nevertheless, uh, we do have something like uh, 20 gigawatts installed in the North Sea right now. So so it's uh, it's it's pretty good. What has been uh, agreed and planned for is the uh, orange dots here, which will end up in. Um, something like uh, 60, 66 gigawatt by 2030. That means already in, in the six, seven years time from now. And uh, one could uh, ask, can the supply chain really live up to that? Uh, and that's a quick, big question. But then the plans uh, for the 2050 development says that we by 2050 in the, in the in European Union uh, should reach a total of uh, 300 gigawatt and most of these 300 gigawatt is planned to be in the North Sea. And in fact, the countries around the North Sea, they have calculated that they, they alone could install these 300 uh, gigawatt. But there are some uh, portion uh, dedicated both to the Baltic Sea and to the Mediterranean and a, a bit to the, the Atlantic coast along France and, and uh, Portugal. But new interesting uh, developments was made uh, last year, where um, few of the uh, partly the EU in the in the in the February uh, launched this, this uh, strategy for the 300 gigawatts. But later uh, the same year, the the EU and the ministers of Denmark, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands agreed uh, another goal, saying that these four countries alone should have uh, 65 gigawatt up running in 2030. 
And uh, that's half of this uh, orange dot here. So, and they should have uh, 150 gigawatt by 2050. So it's a huge build out. And uh, later the same year, the ministers of uh, Poland, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania uh, signed an agreement saying that uh, they foresee or they plan to have uh, close to 20 gigawatt built in the Baltic Sea by 2030. And today there's only 2.2 gigawatt in the Baltic Sea. So it's a, it's a tenfold uh, what we have today to be built in the Baltic Sea. So it's a remarkable development that let, that we look into uh, for for offshore wind in the, both the North Sea but also in the Baltic Sea. But why do wind have such a high interest uh, for all the developers and the countries uh, in the North Sea? We have here a number of of uh, uh, aerial maps uh, showing some of the issues we we have. We have water depths relatively low waters, uh, which uh, range between uh, eight meters close to the coastlines and up to fifty meters uh, out in the central part of the North Sea. And these water depths made it imminent, and and it's sand bed all 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 around the North Sea. So these conditions made it imminent to have uh, monopiles uh, installed, which is relatively easy, and we have a huge supply chain delivering monopiles. If we look at the full load hours in, in the North Sea, we can see that especially in the Danish and, and the Norwegian sectors, but also in the German sector, we have relatively high number of full load hours. Um, and also along some some spots on along the along the Scottish coast and uh, the British coast, we have high full load hours, which make it imminent for, for offshore wind. And what we can see is that um, approximately 70% of the, or no, 90% of the uh, time during the winter months, we have uh, relatively uh, strong and good winds. And 80% uh, of the time during summer months, we have good winds uh, patterns also in, in the North Sea, which makes uh, the, it the imminent place uh, for, for wind uh, utilization. And the North Sea is probably one of the best wind spots in the world. So, so that's why it, it's so interesting. And if we compare the offshore wind uh, with uh, wind development in the other parts of the world and look into the uh, Levelized cost of energy for the offshore wind in the North Sea, you can see that they are relatively high, significant high in, in some areas in the middle of the North Sea, while uh, the LCOE for many other wind spots around the world will range in this area down here. And if you then look here, you can see where the uh, present defined licenses is located. So they are located in these areas where we have. Uh, high number of full load hours, we have high LC week, and we have relatively uh, low water uh, levels. So, so that's why North Sea is so, so interesting for developers and so interesting for the uh, national authorities having the wind developed in, in the North Sea, and that's why we have this huge potential. And when it comes to that, then I can tell you that the North Sea is also quite populated already today by oil and gas platforms that will have to be dismantled in the coming decades. Uh, there's a huge number of marine pipelines, oil and gas pipelines, telecommunication cables, uh, uh, subsea uh, uh, cables, uh, power cables between the countries. So, so there's been a lot of there's a lot of uh, development and there's a lot of uh, issues uh, that can be further developed. In Denmark, uh, the government and the parliament took the decision in uh, 2021 that we should build an artificial energy island. And if we go back here, the artificial energy island is planned to be built in this area here. And uh, yes, uh, we are sometimes laughing at the distance uh, between the coastline and Finnish offshore wind farms. We uh, we talk about uh, 100 kilometers here, so that's another story. Um, 
this uh, the, the the plans for this energy island this is in a sketch of how it could look like uh, the first plan is that uh, it should be capable of uh, operating uh, three gigawatts uh, wind farm and uh, wind uh, power capacity and to be built up to 10 gigawatts in few few years time and that the island should be operational by 2032 there are still uh, an analysis ongoing how to, to make uh, the business case uh, interesting and operational because the Danish government have decided that uh, they should be, be part owner of this island with 51% of the ownership while private developments should build, invest in the island, build the island and have 49% ownership and then have a business case that could uh, pay back the, all the investment cost point. And they're still dealing with how that can be made uh, uh, beneficial for, for the developers. Interesting enough, this initiative have uh, resulted in that uh, both Belgium and Denmark now are working on energy islands. And uh, besides that, Germany has over the last uh, eight, nine, 10 years, established 11 offshore HVDC converter systems in the German sector of the North Sea. HVDC converter system that uh, collects the power from between one and three offshore wind farms and routed to, to, to a converter station down in the, the German mainland, where it then transport further down south. If we look at this uh, energy island for, for a moment, um, it's a bit uh, challenging to build and uh, an energy island and uh, 10, 12 gigawatts uh, wind farm capacities that far from, from, the, from the coastline, uh, approximately 100 kilometers. Uh, we are in the place of the, of the North Sea where the wind conditions are really good, hot, strong winds. Uh, we have a water depth of approximately 30 meters. So we have to build an artificial island on on 30 meters more depth, an interesting topic. Uh, and uh, we have uh, significant wave heights of uh, 10 meters. Uh, we have to calculate with that. But saying that we have significant wave heights of, of 10 meters, then we also know that in, in some con under some conditions, we will have a max wave height of up to 20 to 25 meters. So this island should be able to withstand uh, these uh, strong, strong forces. Then uh, we also have to uh, calculate with something like 85 to, to 90, uh, 90 uh, power cables going in and out from this inner island. There will be a lot of cables from the wind farms going into the island and there will be power cables uh, be to be routed uh, down to, to the countries around uh, the North Sea. The investment, significant approximately 32 billion euros, where the wind farms alone take approximately 45% of that, but the energy island and the transmission equipment take the rest. There are a number of alternatives, which is uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in focus. They have different uh, benefits, but also different uh, challenges. Um, the Belgian island under design right now looks like this. Uh, the suggestion to the Danish island looks like this, or the, like the picture in, in my background here. What they have done in the German Bay is developing uh, this kind of structures. So there are different uh, options here. But why is uh, the North Sea, uh, what, what's the future look for the North Sea? The future, the vision, we have the vision and the vision have been there among the TSOs for a couple of years uh, and also some researchers. And that is, is to build up a huge grid of uh, energy islands in the North Sea. And the energy islands uh, should uh, connect the countries like uh, central energy hubs where you can uh, Take in the offshore produce the wind power and then distribute it to the countries uh, like in the spider web or through other of the inner islands to other countries and you can go both ways we can also transport from one country to through some of the, the hubs to another country and that's in fact what has uh, some of the development for the kriest back in the baltic sea in between denmark and germany right now 
And then also to, to introduce uh, hydrogen, having uh, hydrogen produced out uh, at the sea together with some of the, the energy island hubs, uh, maybe great uh, dedicated uh, power to X islands, and then uh, produce uh, the, the, the hydrogen out in sea and transport it in hydrogen pipelines to the coast. That's uh, that's the future, and that's uh, where we uh, think that the, the the situation will look like in the North Sea by 2040, 2045, 2050, around there. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Sigurd, for your valuable insights uh, for the future at the North Sea. Now we continue with the program. Yes. So I will introduce you to Pekka Pokela, who is a director and ex-partner at Gaia Consulting since 2010. He's also a part-time professor at, of practice at Aalto University in Helsinki. He's broad expert experience in strategy and business consulting covers sectors like marine and offshore re renewable energy, construction, technology and logistics. Pekka has been working with several international business development projects since 2013 and his work for Team Renewable Arctic Finland with 26 companies from all parts of the value chain. Now, Becca concludes the webinar with his presentation. Go ahead, Becca. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will concentrate more a bit the the uh, uh, Finnish businesses export opportunities, of course, uh, dealing a lot with both Baltic Sea circumstances and Baltic Sea states, and and of course the off offshore wind products in the area, also in Finland but also other countries uh, and then what kind of value chain we are, have now collected and that actually started 2018. A group of companies realized jointly that there's a business opportunity for all of them. At that time there was 15, P 15 companies uh, uh, within the cluster, but now it's 26. But this is the outline first, uh, something about the offshore wind potential in Baltic Sea, but both Anni and Sigur actually uh, covered a lot of this topic, so I won't take much time for that. Uh, secondly, some special circumstances in the Baltic Sea uh, uh, area, which makes also uh, Finnish companies very kind of competitive with their core competences in the, in the icing conditions in the Baltic Sea circumstances that's one one slide for that and then at the end uh, some some uh, flavor regarding the Finnish company's expertise in place today with this 26 companies and the parts in the value chain and their role and of, of course the, the business of uh, opportunities they see globally uh, uh, or in the region in the, in the Baltic Sea so these uh, numbers, as we you can pass by, uh, of course, this was the reason the companies realized together when we collected them and had had, had a change discussion with them that should we, uh, as as a group, uh, collect a group of companies to look for the business opportunities globally here. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the. Uh, sorry, I will cover this away. So the fact and what's happening in the market uh, and and uh, when we th think about the installed capacity and the nominal capacity in, in gigawatts it, it means that one building a one gigawatt it, it uh, it's the investment cost is about 1.5 billion euros so that's roughly the, the rule of thumb we, we can estimate also the, the size of the market uh, and uh, um, but there are many information that Sigurd also gave uh, what the different countries in Europe are doing uh, uh, and how, how the potential is seen in different countries in Europe. Of, of course, this is a global market, uh, but but here we uh, concentrate a bit more on the European level. And of course, it's the uh, renewable energy goals, uh, 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 which the European Union has. Uh, but this is a global transition the green transition is global of course at the moment there are some 
challenges uh, in, in the transition and how fast it will go. There are some reasons I can come back to those issues a bit, bit later. But this is anyway a thing that is happening all the time. And it's very much connected with the hydrogen uh, uh, issues, uh, as Ani stated already, and showed the, the need of electricity is growing in Finland remarkably, uh, as, as in every country actually. But there's also uh, a very heavy or very promising interconnection between the uh, the offshore wind, green electricity used for hydrogen production. Uh, so that is in connection with the, with with the future prospects. So here's one slide showing the uh, only as a, as a, as red dots, or not a white or or, or 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 blue dots, and also the hydrogen investments plan. This is not the most recent one, because as as Annie said, every month the situation is is changing. But this is showing only the the Gulf of Botnia. So, of course, the Finnish companies uh, are looking not only the Finnish investments uh, in the offshore wind area or the plants, but also very much looking for the what's happening in, in Sweden, which is, which is kind of a, we, we can call this the Gulf of Botnia as, as, as a uh, Gulf uh, uh, off, offshore wind corridor in a way, because the operation areas uh, from coal, uh, from Venice coast to to Swiss coast is is, is very close, so so uh, this is quite a quite a joint uh, market in in a way. But there are uh, plans of, for both offshore wind and and hydrogen in these areas, and and from the southern part, going a bit closer to to Denmark and and and, and the North Sea area where the where the huge uh, investments are uh, running. Uh, have been running well and are running well, uh, so we are kind of uh, looking uh, at what's happening in the in the Baltic Sea area. Also, Poland needs to be mentioned here uh, as as a huge potential because they have also very challenging targets and objectives in 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 terms of offshore wind production in the near future. Uh, and and why? Offshore wind, uh, uh, the price, uh, uh, the production price is is uh, go, going down. Uh, of course, the big the big units, big uh, um, generators uh, are, are producing uh, more efficiently uh, electricity, and the uh, then the wind circumstances and sea are very good for for uh, wind energy production. These are some studies looking for the for the costs uh, uh, in in electricity production, so it's it, the, the development development is very fast in the in the offshore wind part too. Uh, big components, the technologies developing not only turbines but also foundation structures, uh, and that of course brings uh, uh, interest and motivation for the financing sector to to look for this offshore wind investments uh, uh, very closely. Some uh, secondly, now the uh, some pros and cons concerning the offshore wind in the Baltic Sea circumstances. Uh, this is not a, a direct comparison between North Sea and, and Baltic Sea, but it also shows some some motivation why the Finnish companies are very strong and they have a good kind of a co core competences in in terms of of Baltic Sea circumstances in general. Uh, the generic one, of course, are the uh, the offshore wind speeds are higher. And steadier for those onshore wind, and the coastal energy needs are, are very high very often, uh, and uh, and the uh, the big turbine units are more efficient. Efficient, the performance is higher than the uh, the bigger, um, uh, than the small units, and they don't uh, cause that much harm to to housing and, and inland infrastructure. So those are kind of a generic uh, pause for offshore wind. Uh, of course, they are more expensive to plan, construct, and operate. That's clear. Uh, there are some effects on marine animals, birds, and ecosystems. They're not widely studied. Or not. The studies are ongoing, uh, so a lot of work is done, especially concentrating on the marine 
foreign ecosystems as, as a whole when when uh, uh, the investors are planning planning the offshore wind parks. But then what is uh, so specifically uh, in, in the Baltic Sea, the seawaters are a bit shallow and are those North Sea in general as a whole, but as, I, as Sigurd told that in, in the North Sea area, there are also very good areas and sandy sandy seabeds also for the for the uh, uh, monopile uh, constructions and, and foundations, which are very kind of cost effective in, in, in building building uh, offshore wind parks. The wave heights are lower a bit uh, and tide characteristics uh, milder than in the North Sea, so that kind of brings some advantage uh, in terms of uh, foundation structures in general, but uh, uh, of course that brings some challenges as well. But the sea water salinity a bit lower, of course that's something with the corrosion uh, uh, characteristics uh, in, in offshore structure that is kind of a for, for for Baltic Sea. But then the sea ice limits, that's a very crucial and uh, challenging uh, in, the, in the Baltic Sea areas, especially from the foundations, which is of course its construction timing is very different, but also the, the, the vessel traffic vessel operations uh, needs to be taken into account uh, together with the ice icing uh, characteristics in the Baltic Sea. And also for Finland especially, uh, we, ha we have to be careful with the marine, winter marine traffic uh, and rescue operations because they need to be uh, concurrent, concurrently working with the offshore wind parks. <clears throat> we are very re um, dependent on uh, on marine uh, uh, export, marine traffic. In general, uh, we just lost the the east east uh, uh, border through Russia to to Asia. So. All the logistics uh, are, are very heavily dependent on, on our marine traffic in Finland. So these are kind of a cons that needs to, are, are studied at, at the moment, especially in, in the projects uh, and the planning in planning stages. Uh, and then about coming to to Finnish companies, we uh, we 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 actually produce a brand. Develop a brand with the companies like Team Rydov Arctic Finland, and that is uh, this is a picture showing the, the what kind of uh, kind of sub groups we have within the uh, group of 26 companies. We have investors and product developers here. Of course, they are looking for the full picture in the offshore wind uh, value chain. Uh, but then we have advanced power and marine technologies. Uh, uh, and this is very important to to, to know that there are Finnish uh, kind of a global one of the global uh, leaders, technology leaders in in, in propulsion systems like uh, ABB and Steerprop, which are members in our group. Uh, they all uh, succeeded in getting new businesses uh, with with uh, uh, ship operators that have the big uh, turbine uh, installation vessels. And they, were, they, they are global companies, their customers. Though they succeeded in getting in uh, to, a, to a totally new vessel segment with the propulsion systems. But also in the Baltic Sea circumstances, there needs to be kind of a ice, uh, ice class uh, taken into account, but also other other reasons that uh, maybe the, the vessel uh, pipe, the concept needs to be a bit different than, than it's operated in in other waters and also in, in, in Baltic Sea. So that, that part of the, our cluster is, is very heavily looking for new business opportunities with the ship operators globally in, in the in vessel, special vessels who uh, uh, operate, construct and serve uh, offshore wind parks. And the third uh, group is the, the offshore structures and solutions of their grid issues, power issues, but also the foundation uh, uh, which is, of course, uh, also must take into account the icy conditions in the Baltic Sea circumstances. But of course, if it sustains the ice in the Baltic Sea, of course, the foundation concept is then uh, uh, usable and feasible in, in other other uh, sea areas globally also. And the fourth part is, is very important too. It's logistic services here. Uh, we talk about shipping companies uh, for for uh, 
for for different parts in the uh, in the in the construction site, uh, cargo uh, ships, but also special vessels, but also ports and port operators. And if if you now remember the the Baltic Sea and the Gulf of Bothnia, especially, uh, we have uh, ports uh, from if we start from north, uh, port of Rahe, uh, port of Kokkola, and then port of Pori. Uh, they all are looking not only the finish offshore wind park investments uh, for the future of, uh, from from the future, but also the, the those uh, in the in the Swedish part or a bit a, a close uh, uh, so close that they could kind of support the construction uh, operations. Uh, the operation and the construction requires a lot of land, uh, a lot of warehousing and offshore operations and and a kind of a hub. Uh, way to operate uh, and uh, for the construction. So therefore, we are looking off also for the logistics partners, uh, uh, new business opportunities in this part too. Uh, and these are the companies, and you, 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 uh, I'm sure you, you uh, identify uh, very famous, and 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 maybe some some of your partners as well. So they are planning, uh, engineering, consulting companies, also specialized in ICE. There are construction companies, there are energy companies, investors. Uh, uh, so this is the group uh, we are looking for. We just visited uh, Stockholm, Wind, uh, conference uh, with this group. Uh, 15 of these were present in, in Stockholm with us. Uh, and this is the way we continue our work. So it is a global business opportunity for many of these companies. Some of them are looking for regional business opportunities in the Baltic Sea circumstances, especially that uh, which are connected to the ice abilities we have in Finland. So these are the uh, the investors here we have. We also were glad to have uh, the RWE, uh, the second biggest uh, offshore wind uh, renewable energy company in the world. It's general one, they established their office in Helsinki last January. They are within our group. Uh, then there are these offshore structures and solutions, as I told, very much connected to, to the foundation part. We have companies that have their own patented uh, solutions for the for the foundation part. Also, VTT is, is uh, uh, as a Finnish research center is involved in the in the icing uh, characteristics uh, studies in many projects. Then we have this advanced power and marine, uh, not only the propulsion, but we also have a, a, a small shipyard called Tuavene. They may make uh, work boats. CTVs uh, uh, for the for the offshore wind uh, part too, and of course uh, Akera Arctic is uh, is a ice special uh, uh, ship uh, engineering company. It also uh, started a new business uh, segment in terms of foundation uh, in icy conditions, uh, and this is the logistic services. Uh, one of this uh, these ports is Arahe Port. Uh, I think most of the Vestas turbines on onshore wind parks in Finland have been handled through their premises in 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 Drahe. So they are also investing on the offshore wind facilities in in the, in the port area together with the uh, with the Holy Stegador. That's also Pori is investing uh, for this role and and Kokkola for uh, two. So this was my presentation. I hope I, I kept the time. Yes, thank you, Becca. Uh, thank you also for Anni and Sigurd. Uh, we here at the Sweco and Gaia Consulting can some support you in all of your green transition uh, solu uh, solutions. Uh, for example, solar energy, biodiversity, management consulting, sustainable construction, sustainable uh, mobility and logistics, circular a circular economy, economy and, and green hydrogen. So, so not only offshore wind power. Um, now uh, we're at the end of the webinar, and uh, we're we're going to continue to the 
discussion part. We got some uh, good questions beforehand, and now I would like to ask Sigurd, Anni and Becca to open their cameras once more. And uh, we'll go ahead first with the questions that we got beforehand. And now the chat is open, so you can uh, post your uh, comments and, and questions to the chat box. So we start with a question. Um, how is electricity transmitted to the national grid? Uh, Sigurd could be the right person to answer this question. I will allow your mic, Sigurd, here. Yeah, um, can you hear me now? Yes, Good. yep. Well, um, uh, power produced offshore-wise is, uh, in most cases, uh, collected at an offshore substation uh, where you step up uh, the 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 uh, uh, power from from the turbines which will be delivered uh, today typically at the 66 uh, kV level then you will typically step it up to 132 kV level at the, the wind farm uh, offshore substation and, and then have an AC cable if it's relatively close to the coast an AC cable going into the to the the, the land-based uh, substation that has been pointed out to to receive the power uh, what has been developed over the last uh, eight nine years, uh, especially in the in the North Sea, is the use of HVDC connections, where you take the the power from one, two, three uh, offshore substations, uh, collect them on a uh, converter station, HVDC converter station uh, offshore wise, and then transport it in a DC cable to to the shore, and then uh, connect it directly to the uh, high volt voltage uh, backbone. That's, that's the way to do it. In few cases, we have uh, offshore wind parks so close to the coast, so we take each array string connecting three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten turbines in one array string, and then we put the array strings directly into a land-based uh, substation, which is significantly cheaper than having an offshore substation. Okay. Thank you, Sigurd. Uh, maybe you could also continue with this next question and, and you can put your camera on. Uh, we yeah. cannot see you at the moment. Yes. Thank you. Um, the next question was, how does the increase in wind generated electricity affect the stability of the electric electrical grid when supply cannot be controlled to match the demands? That's a very interesting question, to be honest. Um, and and uh, well, you have to to plan and you have to to look very carefully into how the power grid, uh, the land-based power grid, is uh, structured. And uh, if you are planning it correctly and building it out, taking that into account, then you can handle a huge amount of uh, offshore wind in the grid, even the offshore wind is fluctuating and you can't predict. 100% uh, how the wind uh, will, uh, or how the how much power you would have produced by by the wind. If you take the Danish uh, electricity system, the Danish power grid, there we can accommodate. We have seen at least uh, 120, 130 percent offshore wind produced into the grid, and then we export it to our neighboring countries directly. So, so it can be done, but it's also a, uh, a fact that uh, most European power grids is not uh, built up to that level yet, but it has they have to be in the future. And that's why we have uh, these uh, directives and, and plans, for instance, the Trans-European Transport Energy Network Regulation, that foresee that all countries shall be able to do that in the future. Thank you. Uh, we go ahead with the next question, and this is for Anni. Uh, according with the magnitude of the future plans, are the native experts enough uh, in quantity and expertise, or are you considering the need of hiring foreigners? Oh, extremely good 
question, a topical question right now. Uh, no, we don't have enough experts in, in Finland. What is needed is, is more training in each and every level of the education needed for, for offshore operations. And, and then, of course, we also need the international experts. I think we need them all, both. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the magnitude is so so high at the moment, so yes. that's why we do need all hands on deck. Uh, Sigurd, you had. Uh, yeah, I have a, a comment because uh, I uh, I fully understand uh, why this question has been uh, raised. If we look at the uh, uh, development plan for the North Sea, then we all agree that we just don't have neither the experts to develop, neither the the high technical skilled people to construct nor the capacity among the manufacturers to build all that uh, wind power capacity so so we have we have a challenge and we have to solve that challenge over the coming very few years mm. we all agree on that and and we're not talking about uh, a few thousand people we are talking about hundreds of thousands of, of people to 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 live up to these goals yeah that's true Yes, next question will go to Pekka. Um, what is the development of investment costs for offshore wind power in the coming years? Uh, what are the biggest challenges currently facing offshore wind power projects? It is to continue from the previous discussion that if we, if I start with the last one, so what is what are the difficulties and challenges and challenges is the human resources as we heard, but also uh, 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 a lack of lack of physical resources. I, I just heard in Stockholm that if, if you order marine cables, it takes up to five to six years for the delivery. And in the onshore wind cables, you can you can get from five to six months time. But the marine cables you need here, it's it's years. And that's that's the same with foundation. That's the same with special measures, especially in the in the turbine turbine installation. Even though the companies are building new new ships and designing new ships, it takes about seven years to 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 have have those new ships and new vessels in operation. So, so the resource demand is huge compared to the targets we just showed today. Uh, but also the investment costs. Uh, the, the cost of funding, cost of finance has increased uh, a lot. And that has, uh, it hasn't stopped the planning for the time being. But of course, it it it, it brings a new kind of a new assets to the, the new actual seats are calculated very carefully in, in these days, in these weeks. Uh, uh, so, but the, the cost of finance is actually uh, higher and and I thought that there's a, there's a, I think that there's, there's a race between the technology dependent uh, kind of FE performance uh, improvement, but then on the other hand that the the cost of finance is increasing. I don't I I I might I'm, I'm I must be honest. I don't know what's the match between these two developments, but mm -hmm. but that all are calcul all the investors are, are are going through the calculations very carefully today. Thank you. Um, the next next question is: How does offshore wind power um, is seen in in the operations in inland Finland, and does it create new opportunities for the inland Finland? Uh, Sigurd can start. Well, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, all should be very aware of that the uh, offshore wind development can create businesses also in inland. If you take uh, the Danish example, uh, if you look at the uh, wind turbine manufacturers, both Siemens and uh, Siemens Gamesa and investors, they have their production units uh, inland and are transporting the nacelles out to, to a harbor and then shipping out from there. If you take uh, one of the world's uh, leading uh, turbine uh, tower manufacturers, uh, they are also located uh, inland uh, in the central part of Jutland, and all their towers pieces are transported to a harbor and then shipped off from there. So, so it's absolutely uh, possible to to have inland activities, and 
And if you look at uh, all the services around uh, consultancies, uh, all kinds of services, then then um, then it doesn't matter where they're located. They can be located in the country, along the coast, in the harbor, it could be inland in the country, or it could be in other countries. Does anyone else have a comment? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it, it was directed to Finland, but I think Sigurd has some very good experience from it because we are years back what has happened in Denmark. So we are now going approaching the, 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 the years and the, and the events uh, execution phase that has been uh, re realized in, in, in Denmark. So that's exactly like Sigurd said. Uh, there's a, a broad spectrum of businesses that are in connection with the ec ecosystem. Uh, designing and building and operating offshore wind parks. Of course, the if, if you are located in the offshore, some sectors must be there. Port must be <laughs> in the coast, uh, coastline, and port is an offshore and needs to have a kind of a, a hub uh, in in the coastal area. You you get some advantages to to locate there, but then there are other aspects. Uh, the uh, the the human resources expertise. Uh, raw materials, whatever is placed in other parts. So te te technology companies are very often located in the, in the inner land. So very much uh, the uh, good and positive impacts are, are broader, uh, broader areas and not only the coastal areas and will be also in Finland. Yes, thank you. Then we go to the last question we got uh, in beforehand. Uh, considering wind power and solar energy, which one is more reliable source of energy and what are the limitations of each source? Anni can start. Okay, thank you again for an extremely good question. Um, um, I wouldn't like to put, you know, different electricity production methods against each others. And if we look at, for example, the existing onshore wind power production in Finland and compare it to the uh, planned solar production, you see that the production fulfills its others. Like when, when it's not windy, it's usually sunny and the other way around. Uh, and if we look at offshore wind power in the Finnish sea area, uh, we expect with also offshore more production at winter time when the sun is not shining so much. So I think that they are again like um, um, com compiling very well uh, to the production. But then, of course, if we look at the capacity factors of different production methods, um, offshore has got absolutely the highest of these three then comes onshore and then comes uh, PV, solar PV, but they all have their place in the Finnish electrical system. So they are not like, you know, that if you are building offshore wind power, then you don't need PV or the other way around. Uh, Johanna, your mic is muted. Thank you. I was just asking uh, if Becca or Sigurd want to conclude something. I think Anni, wash the board. Yes. <laughs> I fully agree. Yeah, great. Um, and now we got some few questions in the chat. Let's go to them. We still got five minutes left. Um, that was Nicholas uh, asking about if uh, we could give a little more information about expected use of hydrogen within the Baltic area. Does uh, someone have insight on that or can Sigurd reflect well, the situation in the North Sea, maybe? Well, I would <laughs> just say that I think we need another webinar for hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a long story. How about you, Sigurd? I, I I tend to agree to you, uh, will you Pekka? Uh, but but I think we can give a few words on on the prospects anyway. Uh, there's a lot of uh, heavy industries uh, up along the Botnia Bay, uh, both in Finland and in Sweden, 
We have a huge mining sector in, in the northern part of Sweden and a lot of steelworks. And they are uh, quite uh, significant uh, emitting CO2 today. And uh, if we have to fulfill the EU uh, goal of uh, being carbon neutral by 2050, then we have to do something with these uh, heavy industries and heavy industrial activities. And one, one um, tool we have in the toolbox for that, so that is to replace the existing fossil fuel combustion with some kind of a hydrogen or derivatives of hydrogen uh, instead of uh, could be green uh, methanol or it could be green ammonia. Um, so, so, so that's the way forward, and and that's very closely connected to the hydrogen backbone, which uh, Pega uh, illustrated in his presentation. So that's that that's coming to to be developed uh, in, in one way or another, and and uh, the sooner the better, more or less, because uh, right now we are looking whether it's the chicken or the egg that comes first, but. Uh, we have to make sure that the hydrogen and the offshore wind comes together and goes hand in hand here. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to also add that the Finnish government has has set a target in their governmental program that ten um, percent of the planned hydrogen production of of the EU level hydrogen pro production EU level hydrogen target that ten percent of that would be produced in Finland by twenty thirty. And then, of course, also some products that are, are produced from from hydrogen. Was it also ten percent of those? So Finland has got a high high ambitious also in in high ambition also in in hydrogen. Exactly, and also the International Maritime Organization, which is a global organization, as it, as it states in its name, has a very challenging targets in, in reducing emissions. So that's also kind of a forcing all the shipping companies, but also ship and, and vessel technology providers, propulsion uh, technology providers to develop engines, power systems uh, to, uh, that are used from the e-fuels. And the e-fuel word uh, is something that uses uh, hydrogen as, as a raw material. So this is a very but kind of a big sector, which is all again in, a, in connection with with the hydrogen, but also in connection with the with the green electricity. Yes, thank you. We now got one minute left, so unfortunately we cannot go through all the questions in the chat. But very interesting questions. We'll um, continue the um, um, discussion uh, by email with you guys. Thank you for those questions. So now I'd like to thank you all speakers and thank you participants. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this concludes our webinar now. Uh, the webinar was recorded and you will receive the recording in your email within a few business days. The recording is also available on the website, uh, the webinar series. Uh, the next webinar will take place in late November. I will share the link in the chat box uh, that will be held in Finnish language and it's, it covers uh, solar energy uh, services. So please sign up if you're fluent in, in Finnish language. Um, so thank you all and um, have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.